Acts chapter 20 is a famous passage where often people will quote a 2020 vision where it deals with going out and preaching the gospel as every born again Christian is commanded to do. I want to talk tonight not just about the gospel, but I want to talk about a false gospel. I want to talk about the gospel of the Pharisees. The word Pharisee is often thrown around at those that they would say live a legalistic lifestyle. Um, I've been called a Pharisee because I say that a Christian shouldn't go and get drunk and that I say a Christian should stay married and that a Christian should support their family. That's not what a Pharisee means. A Pharisee is truly someone that's really focused in on the law, but the Pharisee was separated by the law for the wrong reason. The Pharisee was the one that said we can be saved by the law. That we can obtain righteousness, or our ticket to heaven, if you will, by keeping the law. So tonight I want to talk about the gospel of the Pharisees, which is called Lordship Salvation. Some will call it that. They say you're not really saved if you have not made the Lord, or Jesus, Lord over all of your life. If you have some sin in the cupboard at home, then you're not really saved yet. That is called work salvation. And no man will be able to get to heaven and say, I'm here because of what I did. No one will be able to get to heaven and say, I'm saved because I turned from my sin, because I stopped uh, smoking and joking and drinking and cussing and running around, and because I stopped doing those things, or because I started doing all the right things. I take care of my family, and I go to work, and I feed the poor, and I, I love people, and that's why I'm going to heaven. Listen, that's called works salvation. To, today we live in a time where there's a big separation in Christianity, and most Christians believe that you have to repent of your sins to be saved. That's called Lordship Salvation. That is you trusting in your own works to get to heaven. And I want to show you a few things in the Scriptures tonight about how this truly is the acts or the deeds of the Pharisees and that they ended up in hell. You can, listen to this, you can repent of your sins and go to hell. And yet there are Christians in heaven today that failed at ceasing from sin in their life, but they trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ. They're saved by faith in the finished work of the Son of God. And because of that, they're in heaven. They're alive forevermore. This is such a dividing thing. Uh, if you took a room full of pastors and asked each one of them what they thought about repentance, you would quickly find out that some of them believe that you're not really saved if there's no evidence of works and a, clearly that there's a new man. And I want to be clear. I want to go on the record and say this. Listen, if you're saved, you ought to repent of your sins every day to honor the Lord, to live right. Listen, Repenting of sins cannot save your soul. However, it can save your body from an early death. It can save your life from a destruction. We ought to turn from our sin, let our light so shine before men that they may, we may glorify our Father, they may see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. So should we repent of our sins? Of course we should. Is that how we get to heaven? No. If you think you have to turn from sin to obtain salvation, you are not saved. Worse than that, those that know what I'm saying and understand the difference and they preach otherwise, they're not only not saved, they've entered into the category of a false prophet preaching a false gospel. This is not a small thing. This is a really, really big deal. This is the difference between biblical Christianity and every other religion under the planet. The Catholics don't shy away from it. They don't hide it. They'll gladly tell you, well, first you have to uh, be christened and then baptized and then what? Then the sacraments and then you got to go into a little box and tell your dirty secrets to some man in a dress. How weird and perverse. And they say, through all of that, if after you've died, somebody comes and prays you and pays you out of purgatory, then you might go to heaven. Man, that's weird, strange, and impossible, isn't it? We have to be perfect to go to heaven. No one's going. Jesus knew that. He understands the infirmities, the weaknesses, and the sickness of our sinful flesh. Therefore, He died for all the sins of the whole world. And He's offered us the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're not saved by turning from sin. This is so important. This is paramount. This is the difference between who is really a Christian 
and who's just a Christian in name only. There are plenty of people that say, oh yeah, I like God. Oh, I name the name of Christ. Oh, I go to church. And you say, what do you have to do to go to heaven? Well, you got to turn over your life. You got to turn from sin. Are you 100% sure you're going? I hope so. Is there anything you could do to lose it? Oh yeah, all sorts of stuff. They're not saved. They're trusting in their works, the works of their flesh. And Jesus said, or it says in Isaiah, right, that it's like uh, filthy rags. You're going to bring your absolute best, which is insufficient. Imagine a court case. You run a red light. The cops are sitting there watching. They got you on video. Boy, you're busted. Not only did you just run a red light, you ran over somebody. You killed them. You're standing before the judge and you say, but I repent of my sin. I won't kill anybody else. I'll stop for all the red lights. It's not enough. Only the blood sacrifice of the innocent blood, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, is enough to pay for your sin. You cannot obtain salvation by repenting of your sins. Many people repent of their sins and end up in hell because they failed to completely trust Jesus that what He did was enough. They die wondering and doubting because they know who they are and that they're not enough. In Acts chapter 20, look at this. Let's look at verse 20. Acts chapter 20, verse number 20, he says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. He wasn't hiding anything. He, he unloaded the truck. Paul gave him everything. He said, this is everything you need to know about the gospel and life. So he gave them all. Look at verse in the next. He says, But have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Listen, despite our communist government in Washington and the Department of Health that wants to say, oh, don't gather together because there's the seasonal sniffles or the flu or whatever name they call it. When the government tells you, don't go to church, you say, get out of my life, government. Yeah. The government has no right to tell you to not go to church. Oh, don't have church. Don't get what Paul said. He said, I, I kept back nothing that was profitable. In other words, it is profitable for you to, look, he says, taught you publicly. We didn't close our doors. No, not once. I don't, well, what if the health department official shows up? Well, we'll figure it out then. I know many other churches all across the world that close their doors. Some have still not even completely opened their doors. Some of them are hiding behind a, a, a Zoom camera somewhere. Like, oh, well, I'll give you a few verses. And listen, we're called to congregate. He says, he says, I've taught you publicly and from house to house. Not only do we gather together, but we go out and we preach the gospel. We go out and we knock door to door to door. And we, we pray for God to send us to the people that actually have a desire to be saved that want to be saved. And he answers that prayer. Look at the next verse, verse 21. He says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, that means everybody, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith. Now, I preached a sermon a few months ago at length, even going into the details of the origins of the words. And we don't have to go that far. The Bible tells us to repent means to change your mind. That's all it means. Repentance does not mean turn from sin. I want you to understand what this verse is saying. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It's saying you need to change your mind about God and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. For you to repent means to change your mind. For instance, if you're a Catholic and you believe the Pope has some special power and you believe your sins are absolved in a confessional booth or by burning a candle, you need to change your mind about those works, those deeds. You need to turn from them and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. That's repentance that will save. Do you understand? Uh, you, if, you're, if you're a Pentecostal and you feel that uh, you have to have some uh, a second, third, fourth work of the Holy Spirit, you have to roll around and make funny noises and speak in some language nobody knows, and that proves that you're saved, well, that's not salvation either. Salvation is by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ, in His completed work. And once you're saved, you're always saved. If we have to re-save ourselves, then there's not, listen, you're not saved. You're trusting in your own works. If our works could overturn our salvation, then we're trying to earn salvation by our own merit. And God will not accept that. Repent means to change your mind. Change your mind about God and trust in Jesus. This is what we're commanded to do here. Repent does not mean to turn from sin. That is not what the definition means. This Bible 
does not say repent of sins or repent from sin no not one time now understand i am here to tell you once you're saved you ought to live for god or he will correct you he will chastise you if you're thankful for what he's done for you you ought to sacrifice your desires and live and work for him while there's time however it's important to make this clear distinction you are not saved by turning from sin many people have turned from sin and ended up in hell. Repent does not mean to turn from sin and save yourself from the punishment of sin. You can't turn yourself from hell. You deserve hell by your works and only Christ alone and His gift can save you from hell. This is so important. I remind you the first mention of repent in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 6 where God repented of making man on the earth because they were so evil and cruel and violent and wicked and perverse. And he says, I'm repenting of making man and I'm going to have to flood the whole earth. Remember that? Now listen, if repent meant turn from sin, then that would imply that God could sin. God cannot sin. Repent does not mean turn from sin. It cannot mean that. If you would go to Acts chapter, I'm sorry, go to Matthew chapter 27. We're going to come back to Acts 20 in just a second. Go to Matthew chapter 27. The Bible does not teach that salvation is by repenting of your sins. You have to understand this. This doctrine is not in the Bible. This concept is not in the Bible. You cannot find it anywhere except inside of a, a dictionary or a chick track or the Catholic Church or even a Muslim. I spent 45 minutes talking with a Muslim in his own, own home one time and ultimately that's what he continued to say was that if he would turn from sin, ultimately Allah might accept him. That's work salvation. In fact, that is not salvation. That is not good news. Could you imagine if somebody said, okay, you can go to heaven. All you have to do is carry this boulder up the mountain and never slip. Oh man, that's impossible. Who then could be saved? Exactly. We need the gift of God, which is eternal life. I want you to see this. I want to show you a few things tonight. And I just pray that this would be a blessing to you and help you understand the importance of it. Uh, if you ever hear somebody say repent of sins, you better have them define it if they're not clear. I have met a pastor one time, or two or three I could name in the past, that said, oh, no, no, I don't mean turn from sin for salvation. I just simply meant you have to change your mind about how you see your sinful state and that you need a Savior. Salvation is only by the Savior. And because of the Savior, only we're saved. And some people may use a phrase that's not found in the Bible because they heard it in a movie or saw it in a tract or even heard some other man say it. So uh, give them some, some space if they say it once lightly. But if there, you can tell, you can tell those that mean it and say that you have to work your way to heaven by changing your lifestyle. You should forsake that person, avoid that person, and if necessary, you should rebuke them because the Bible does not teach that repenting of sins will save your soul. Salvation is not achieved by turning over a new leaf or by cleaning up your life. It is by grace through faith. It is not of your works. There is nothing you can do. Uh, it is a free gift. It is completely unearned. Uh, hey, Christmas is here. Now, if you're getting a Christmas present, raise your hand. Maybe, oh, come on, James, surely you're going to get a Christmas present. You're getting a Christmas present. Now, have you ever had anybody give you a Christmas present and then say, okay, now let me give you this envelope and inside is the receipt. You're going to have to pay me back. What? I'll keep my money. You keep your box of goods. You know, I didn't even like it that much anyway, right? It doesn't work that way. Otherwise, it's not a gift. It's not a present. Grace means gift. Grace is free. I want to show you through the Bible, through the Scriptures, that grace is the free gift, and it's by our trusting it, the faith, that we take the gift, and when you have the gift, you have it forever. This is the message that we're to share with everyone. Only biblical Christianity teaches salvation by faith. False Christianity and every other religion teaches that it is by your works. Allow me to open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that at this moment,
that at this time tonight, you would help us all to pay attention, be alert, awake, and ready to receive the scriptures. Lord, I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of your word, that tonight you would be successful in this sermon, that you would wake people up to the fact, the reality, that those that preach a repent of your sins salvation, that they are not saved, that they're doing the work of the devil as they draw people away from you. Lord, I pray that you would, again, just use this, Lord. I pray you would use me and that you would get all the honor and all the glory tonight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My first point, you're in Matthew 27, find verse number 3. My first point is that Judas repented of his sins and he went to hell. Look at verse 3, it says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, you hear it? repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Oh no, I'm busted. I, 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 what should I do? I should turn from my sin. I'm sorry, officer. I'll never do it again. You still have to pay for the ticket. You understand, even when you repent of your sin, there's still a payment. Now the good news is, if you're saved by faith in Jesus, all of your sins in eternity have been paid for. However, if you continue in sin, in willful sin on the earth, there's still going to be a punishment in your body on the earth. God may take away your job or your car. He may take away a, an arm or a limb or a family member because of your foolish decisions to continue in sin. These things very well could happen. There's the warning, if you continue in sin, you're going to destroy yourself. So uh, as a Christian, we try to avoid it. But now, Judas was not saved because he did not believe. He walked with Christ and didn't believe in Christ. He uh, betrayed him. In John 17, it says, or Jesus speaking, he says, none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. He called Judas the son of perdition. Do you know what perdition is? Perdition is damnation or destruction. He is the son of the damned. He's calling him a son of the devil, essentially, is what he's called. This man had already hardened his heart against God so much that he was a son of the devil, refused to believe, and he had such a seared conscience and a reprobate mind, it didn't bother him a bit. After seeing all those miracles, he was only there for the money. He was only there for what power he could get out of it. It didn't bother him a bit to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. If you would, go to Matthew 21. Go back a few pa pages to Matthew chapter 21. I want you to know that repenting of sins, listen, is works. We're not saved by works of righteousness, which we have done. We are not saved by our works and deeds. But repenting of sins is works, and works can't save you. In Jonah 3.10 it says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. God saw them turning from sin, and he says, that's works. Sometimes God wants that in a Christian life. Let's not forget that. I'm not preaching live in lasciviousness and live in sin. Hey, as a Christian, get out of the sin. Get out of the quagmire and the muck. However, don't trust in your own ability to get to heaven. In Galatians 5, he says, Christ has become no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. You can't have grace and works saving you at the same time. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. In Hebrews 1, he says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Remember this phrase. If anybody ever says, oh, what about James 2? Faith without works is dead. You say, hey, what about Hebrews 6? Where it says, repentance from dead works. If you don't have faith for salvation, all of your repentance is dead works, and it won't earn you a thing. It will never get you to heaven. It will never even get you a reward in heaven as an unsaved person. Your dead works. He says, repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Amen. It's only faith toward God that can save the soul. Yeah. It's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, this is the biggest issue in Christianity. You're in Matthew 21, find verse 32. You know people tonight that are in your family or friends that if you ask them, they would say, I'm a Christian, of course I am. Well, well I'm not a, a liberal, or I'm not a communist, or I'm not a pagan, or I'm not a Muslim. But if they're not trusting on Jesus alone, they're not saved. 
I often use the illustration of my Bible. And if you look up here for just a moment, I will say, I am only holding my Bible with my right hand. Is that correct? Yeah. Amen. Is it still true I'm only holding it with my right hand? No. It's no longer true. Yeah, but it's just one finger. It doesn't matter. That's my left hand. I'm saved by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you should turn away from your sin. You, you have to turn from sin to be saved. When they say, well, and you have to have repentance. What kind of repentance? Well, if you don't turn your life around, if there's no evidence of salvation through your works, then you're not saved. What they're doing is they're taking away from the Lord Jesus Christ and they can name His name, but the truth is they're trusting in their own works and not Christ. This is the biggest issue in Christianity. You're in Matthew 21, find verse number 32. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, look, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. Do you know how to repent and be saved? Change your mind about only trusting in Christ. Believe him and be saved. If you would, go back to Acts chapter 20. If you believe you have to repent of your sins to be saved, you need to repent of that doctrine and you need to turn only to Christ and believe that He and His work alone was sufficient for your salvation and that there are no works necessary from you for your salvation. The two should be separated. Repenting of sin for salvation is not implied anywhere in the Bible. The Bible does not teach turn from sin to be saved. And there are many verses that people will bring up. Well, what about this one? What about that one? And I guarantee you should prove it to yourself. You should prove it to yourself. Start asking around. Ask your friends that claim to be a Christian. What do you think about repentance? And if you, if you hear bad doctrine, they're going to give you a verse. Well, Hebrews 6 or uh, Hebrews 10 or, or uh, James 2. They're going to start pulling these verses out. Well, I've heard somebody preach this. Well, what about Matthew 7? They'll start pulling verses out and you say, well, let's go there. Whenever somebody brings out a verse about salvation that sounds like works, the only thing you can do, if you don't already have it memorized, is go there and look at it and say, well, let's read it and see what it says. Because you know what it doesn't say? It doesn't say you're saved by turning from sin. It doesn't say that anywhere. Being sorry for sin is not how forgiveness is applied to your account. Do you understand that? I'm so sorry, judge. Please forgive me. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm contrite. I'm broken. Please let me off. I'm glad you're sorry. That's good. And you won't be doing it a while because you're getting locked up. Being sorry does not apply forgiveness to your account. Only Jesus does. And faith in Him. Taking the gift. Being sorry in court doesn't pay for crime. You're back in Acts chapter 20. Let's pick up in verse number 23. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city. Why? The Holy Spirit comes in you when you're saved and you should witness. This is how other people get saved. Saying that bonds and afflictions abide me, but none of these things moved me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Did you notice in your Bible right there that it does not say the gospel of repentance? D did you notice that? It doesn't say the gospel of repent of your sins. It says the gospel of the grace of God. Salvation is by faith. That's what you choose to believe in. It's your choice to have faith through grace. And grace equals gift. That's what it means. And God has given us so many gifts. He's given us gift after gift after gift, starting with salvation. Then He's given you blessings. He's given you wisdom and understanding and discernment of the Scriptures. Then He gives you spiritual gifts. And if you want a spiritual gift, what, what's He say in, in Corinthians? He says, yeah, but rather that you should prophesy, you, know, it, you should have some gifts, but it's better if you learn to preach the Bible is what it's teaching. Salvation is called the gift of God. It's not called the wage of labor. Yeah. If you clock in at your business, and call, you, know, you clock in, you clock out. You clock in, you clock out. Here, here comes Friday. The boss says, here you go. I've got a big gift for you. 
well, this isn't a gift. You owe that to me. I worked for you and you promised you'd pay me and you better pay me or I'm turning you into the labor board, right? That's not a gift. That's a wage that you've earned. Well, we haven't earned heaven, nor can we. Uh, jump back real quick to Acts 19, the beginning of the chapter, Acts 19. Salvation is not owed to you because you stopped certain sins. Again, no one will get to heaven and say, God, you owed it to me. If you doubt what somebody believes about repentance or about works, simply ask them, what do you think you have to do to get to heaven? And if they seem a little muddy or it's hard to really cut through what they believe, try a different question. Ask them, if you were standing before God right now and he said to you, why should I let you in heaven? What would you say to him? You answer that in your own heart, in your mind right now. And if your answer is anything other than I believed in Jesus, then you have a problem and you're on your way to hell. Hell is real. It's eternal torment. It's fire. It's forever. He's not willing that any should perish. Jesus died for your sins. He took your hell. He paid for your punishment. He says, here you go. I paid for it. Take the gift. It's up to you. Take the gift. Call upon me and I'll save you. That's his promise. You're in Acts chapter 19. I just want you to understand, sinners are only saved by accepting God's gift. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even though you still struggle with sin, he paid for those sins. Now, John the Baptist, here's my next point. John the Baptist taught salvation by faith without repenting of your sins. That's salvation. Look at Acts 19, verse 4. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Paul affirmed what John the Baptist taught was salvation by faith alone without any works. Go to Acts chapter 20 again. Jesus taught salvation by faith alone without repenting of your sins. Do you understand that? Jesus, not one time did he say, turn from your sin, repent of your sin. In Mark 1.15, Jesus said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. When he said, change your mind, what did he say change it about? The gospel. Why? Because he, as the object of the gospel, the Son of God, the Messiah that came to take away the sin of the world, he's saying, you need to change your mind about how to be saved. You need to stop trusting what the Pharisees are teaching by keeping the law, and you need to believe on me as Christ, and you'll be saved. Jesus Christ Taught that. Matthew 21, we saw it when you had seen it, you repented not after that you might believe in him. That's what Jesus said. Speaking of what John preached, Jesus preached, repent, change your mind, and believe on him for salvation. Paul the Apostle taught salvation by faith without repenting of sin. You're back in Acts 20, find verse number 28, please. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Notice he's purchased with his own blood. You are not purchased with your sorrow or with your apology or with your changed life. You were purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, what does a wolf want to do? Just as the, the devil, a lion, wants to devour somebody and take what they have, a covetousness of their, of their stuff and their life. Look at verse 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. You know what a false prophet wants to do? They want to find a simple-minded, Bible-believing Christian, and they want to say, just believe what I say. My interpretation is better than what you've heard. They want to prey on God's people and steal from them like a wolf. They want to extract life and blood and money out of people. There are many false prophets gone into the world. In this Repent of Your Sins gospel, this is like the biggest red flag. Anybody that says you have to turn from sin as part of salvation is not saved. And be careful, they might be a wolf. Yeah. 
They might be a hard-hearted, seared, conscience, wicked false prophet. In Galatians 1, he says, uh, there be some, of the, some that trouble you who would pervert the gospel of Christ. They would pervert it. They would change it. They would pollute it, disfigure it. And he says, let them be accursed. He says, they're already cursed by God. You just let them be accursed. You get away from them. Hey, that old thing, I'm getting out of here. Lightning might strike any minute the way you're acting and talking, right? When people act like that, you get away from them. Acts 20, look at verse 31. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one night and day. For three years, he warned this church, be careful, they're going to come in, they're going to pervert the gospel. Be careful, they're like wolves, they want to eat you up. They want to devour you. Keep your heart pure. Keep the doctrine in your heart. Continue in the things that the disciples have taught, that Christ taught them. Don't get off. Look at verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. He says, it's the gospel that saves, and it's the gospel that builds. It's the, it's the word of God that will build you up in your life. You say, okay, I got it. I'm saved. It was by faith alone. I know I should do some work, and it's through the word of God. He'll show me what I need to work, and he'll teach me what I ought to do, and he'll, I'll have an understanding. It's, these things are spiritually discerned. But he says in the next verse, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Now, why is Paul bringing this up? He's warning about the false prophet that's going to come in and all he wants is in your pocketbook and your heart and your life. He wants to devour a church. Isn't that what a false prophet does? That's exactly what they do. Go to Matthew 23 and let's finish there. Go to Matthew chapter number 23. In Matthew 23, this is just a scathing rebuke by the Lord Jesus Christ against these false Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees still exist today. They are still in Israel. All right, It's the synagogue of Satan. They teach salvation by works and keeping their law, which is called the Talmud. It's not the law of God. It's not the word of God. They perverted it so much that it's barely recognizable. In fact, most of the traditions and things that they do are not even found in scriptures anywhere. The Pharisees taught repenting of your sins for salvation. And yet, listen to this, the Pharisees went to hell. They went to hell. What is being pharisaical? That's to say your works can save your soul. That's a Pharisee. That reminds me today often of the missionaries or moochinaries, call them what you want. I've got a lot of problems with a lot of missionaries. We've had a lot come through here and barely have we found one that even had the right gospel. That could, that could say, that they understood the basics of salvation. Barely have we even found a one that would open a Bible and go out and knock a door and preach the gospel to their neighbor here. But they say, oh, give me some money and I'll go out there in another country where you can't see me and you don't know their language and trust me, I'll represent Christ on your behalf. There's a, a Baptist mission board just down the road from here, and they expect their candidates to raise $8,000 a month, then give 25% of it to them, so they're going to go on the field and live on $6,000 a month in a foreign country. To me, I mean, that sounds like vacation. I, I want to go to Italy. Ooh, ooh, I'm going to Hawaii. Look, we live in a sad state in America where, it's, where there is literally uh, Pastor Palacios that preached for us a few weeks, a few months ago. His church sponsors a church in Mexico that sends Spanish-speaking missionaries to the United States. Do you understand what's happened? Oh, God's protected America because of all the missionaries we send. Yeah, well, now we have the missionary industrial complex, and they're after your wallet, your gold, your silver. They're preaching a false gospel, and God's going to judge that. Now God's sending missionaries to America because we don't have enough Bible-believing preachers? We got a problem. We got a problem. We need to do our duty of preaching the gospel where we can. They're after your money. They'll say anything to get it. Oh, I don't know. What do you believe, brother? Oh, I believe the same thing. That's not conviction. Matthew 23. Look at this real quick. Verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying... The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe. In other words, when they teach the law, the word of God, what they're saying is true because it came out of the word of God. That much you observe. That observe and do. But do not ye after their works. 
For they say and do not. They're total hypocrites. They say one thing and they do another. Their works were polluted when they opened the Word of God and say what it says. That was true. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. I, again, imagine the illustration of a boulder. Imagine we had a boulder as large as this wooden desk. And I said, put this on your back, strap it to your body, and carry it for the rest of your life to prove your dedication to Jesus. You would say, oh man, how can I even? And they won't even move it with their finger. They're preaching works salvation. They're making you do something that's impossible. The illustration that Jesus is using here, do you understand? I mean, there might be, well, let's, let's be real. We got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six men in here. Brother Chad's not here. We'll give him a cut. All right. Six of us probably at least could pick this up and strap it on our back. Now, I'm not saying how long you keep it there or how far you carry it, but I think every man in here is uh, a strong bodied and mind willed enough to be able to do that. How long can you do it for? Because as soon as you waver, falter, fall, well, there you go, you lost your salvation. You imagine what the Pharisees were doing to people. People would come to them in search of God and asking a Bible question because they were the literate. They had the oracles of God and they would say, well, what does this mean? Or how can I do this? Or I need reconciliation. Oh, I tell you, just, just give me some money and put something in the coffer here. And then, and then you know, say, what, what's the, uh, say 10 Hail Marys and, you know, pray the rosary. And, you know, just like the Catholics, they added work upon work upon work and made it impossible. Yeah. This is the gospel of the Pharisees. It's to repent of your sins. Anybody that says that is giving you an impossible task. They would call it a fool's errand. Hey, can you go get me a bucket of steam? Uh, what? Can you get me the, the, the pipe stretcher? I'm sure there's many other good analogies. A pipe stretcher? Never heard of one. Oh, okay, right? A bucket of steam? How do you do that? It's all going to evaporate. I can't do that. Yeah, you can't repent of your sins. Figure it out. You're in the flesh. You're in the body of sin. You'll sin until the last day here, and then you'll be resurrected and totally righteous. Until then, be thankful for your salvation and do your best to work for Christ. Look what he says in verse 5. He gives you their heart. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. They want to wear the big wide border on their garment with blue so you know they're holy, so you know they're the Pharisees. Oh, this isn't wide enough. We need to add another one so everybody can see me walking from a mile away and know that I'm one of the holy ones. Uh, what do you say? Holier than thou. That's how they think. I'm better than you because I know something you don't and I tell you what to do. That was their mentality and it was wicked. And all their works they do for to be seen of men. This is the vast majority of religion today. I rise early and I do this and I go down there and I feed them and I, I help the widows. Why? To be seen of men. Be careful. The repent of your sins gospel is wicked. Now, he says they make broad their phylacteries. That's the only place in the Bible you have not mention of that. Uh, I think they call it the Teflum today, which is where they strap a little black box with leather around them and they do it over here. It's a satanic ritual. It was a works-based ritual. It was from their tradition. It's not in the Bible anywhere. They claim it's, well, we're taking the Word of God and putting it on our forehead so everybody can see it or putting it on our hands so everybody sees that we're doing the law. Again, all of their works were to be seen by men. Why do they not cut their... They're, I don't know, what, what is it? What do they don't cut right here? You know, they don't cut that and leave it long. Why? Oh, a chew. I'm sorry, did you sneeze? God bless you, right? Oh, why do you have those blue strings hanging out from under your belt? Well, don't you know I'm one of God's chosen people? Don't you see my outfit? That's not God's people. That's not what it was about. Right. It's a heart issue. You can't see salvation. Hey, sometimes your spirit will bear witness with our spirit and you can sense it. You can, you can get a, a sense of it. But here, they did all these works just to be seen of men. Matthew 23. Uh, uh, let's just read a couple more verses out of here and we'll be done for tonight. Look at verse 23. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Why? Hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Get what he's saying. Well, we should give 10% of everything God gives us. Amen. That's a biblical concept. You live off 90 and God blesses your 90 and makes the 90 bigger. But they were so... It's like, oh, somebody gave me a sheet of paper. 
That's 10%. I'll put it in the offering and let everybody see me. Right? They're trying to be seen of men. Oh, I, I tithe off every little stitch that I'm given. I give it back to God. Why? They just want to be seen of men. Look what he says in the rest of the verse. But have omitted, it says, the weightier matters of the law. The heavy things, the things that matter, which are judgment, mercy, and faith. They did it for their works, but they didn't have faith. They weren't trusting in salvation by faith, but you sure could see their works. You know, look, he defines judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done, and not to have left the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain in a gnat and swallow a camel. He says, you're so blind, and it's the blind leading the blind. You strain at a gnat. It's like, can you imagine if we had a bowl of soup this big, and you're like, pick it, trying to get one gnat out of it, out of this big bowl. But then he says, you swallow a camel. So like you make a big deal out of the little things, and you let the things that God says are big, you just let it all pass and let it slide. That's unrighteous. They couldn't judge. They weren't showing mercy where they should, and they did not have faith as they were too. Now look at verse 26. Now blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup. He's talking about your heart, salvation by faith, and the platter, and the outside of them may be clean also. Then, so in other words, get saved by trusting in Jesus. Then you're sealed unto the day of redemption. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians 4. Uh, I, I use the illustration, if I had a can of white paint and I threw it in the mud, but the lid is on, it's clean on the inside, it's dirty on the outside. Well, that's you in this body. You've got your sin in the body, but you're pure on the inside because you're sealed by that Holy Spirit. You're purified by His blood, right? Uh, so he told them, get your heart right first, then work on the outside. All they did was show off on the outside. Verse 28, we're almost done. Look at this, verse 28. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within, that's their heart, you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. People saw them walking down the street and they said, oh, it's a man of God. Oh, it's one of the holy Pharisees. And they probably walked all funny and had big funny hats and robes and probably made all the sounds and everything as if they were something special. Tradition. And they weren't saved. God said, I see your heart and it's full of iniquity. You're full of sin and unrighteousness. Look at verse 33 and we'll stop with this. Ye serpents, now that's a name for the devil, a snake, right? That dragon. Ye serpents, ye generation, which is children, of vipers. He's calling them children of the devil. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Jesus says everything you do, all of your works are to be seen by men. You don't have any faith. The gospel of the Pharisee is repent of your sins. And they're not saved. And not only did Jesus say you're on your way to hell, He says you cannot escape hell. There comes a point in somebody's life where uh, you could call it, I've heard it called the reprobate road, or you're crossing a path with God, where God brings you to a point. You've been warned, you've been warned, you've been warned. This is the final opportunity and the last chance with God. And sometimes you're confronted with the truth, confronted with the truth, and you harden your neck. You don't look, you don't want to deal with it. Although Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, not all will be saved. Some put it off as if they have to somehow get better. Can you imagine what if you had an abscessed tooth? And let's say this tooth had been bothering you well for a month to the point of throbbing and hurting. You can't hardly eat. You wake up in the middle of the night and boy, it's hurting and you're crying. And you know, what do I do? I've tried this. I put that on. Boy, that tooth is getting bad. And somebody says, hey, here's a blank check. Go to the dentist on me. And you say, no, 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 brother. I'm going to wait for it to get better. I'm going to repent of my sins before I come to Christ. I'm going to wait and I'm going to turn my life around. I'm just not ready to receive that gift yet. I'm waiting for some special moment. Can you imagine if your house was on fire and the fire department shows up and they knock on the door and they say, now, before we save you, let me know if you're sorrowful for playing with fire. Otherwise, we're not going to save you. Oh, before we save you, let me know how well you appreciate the local fire department. When you got that phone call and they asked for a donation last year, did you donate? Because if not, we're not going to save you. Think about it. 
It's foolishness in every other area of life, but when it comes to religion, because our human nature is sinful, and our tendency is to try to have our part in our own salvation so we can be proud about it, we have this stumbling block. Salvation is simple. You have to humble yourself as a child and have faith as a child. Do you understand that you flip that light switch and the lights come on? Every child understands that and they flip it by faith. They don't understand what a bank account is or a routing number or an online payment. They don't even know how to write a check to pay the power bill. They don't know who JEA is or how it's being transferred or generated or how it makes it here and into the building. They have no clue. But by faith, they say, boop, and they flip it on. Salvation really is that simple if you'll humble yourself and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, reject this gospel of the Pharisees, which is by works. And Jesus said, look at it again in verse 33. Look at the end of verse 33. He says, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Most of these repent of your sins gospel preachers cannot escape hell. They are intentionally preaching a false prophet, a false gospel, because they've coveted after your silver and your clothing, your gold, whatever. And listen, they've repented of their sins, and they will go to hell. John MacArthur, John Piper, Ray Comfort. I mean, give me another one. They're nameless. We could name them all night. It's that bad. But thank God that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You for saving my soul, Lord, not from anything that I've done, not from anything that I've started to do or stopped doing. Lord, I'm so thankful that salvation is easy. Lord, I love You and I love the fact that You've called us to go out and tell this to others. Lord, I pray that You would just bless this church and give us the opportunity and the fire and the zeal to help others see this truth and get saved. Lord, I love You and I pray that You would use this sermon. I pray that You would use these words to change somebody and help them repent of believing and repenting your sins. We ask this in Jesus' name.